Good morning, Michael. How are you doing today? I'm great, Arrow. How are you? Fantastic. Uh, this this book comes out at, at a really prime time, and maybe it's because I'm just that old guy that, that's standing there watching the world, but I, I'm seeing a lot of Nirvana t-shirts. I'll go up to someone and say, tell me about your experience with Nirvana. It's a t-shirt, dude. I just bought it. And it's like, we need books like this so that we can amplify the story. Yes, exactly. And, you know, and what a story it is. It's like a, a life changing, you know, a world changing rock band who really, I think, embodied a, a a certain generation, but also, like you say, like speaks to the current generation, too. And you, yeah, you see Nirvana T-shirts still on the street. That's wild. 30 years later. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Yeah. And so I I tried to explain in part, you know, that's what, what the Amplified Come As You Are is about. Why why did this band resonate so hard then and now? The thing the thing about Nirvana, I was that jock that was on the radio, plus I was also that mobile entertainer that went into the high schools to play this music. I watched oh. those people grab that music and call it their own. And to this day, it, it's like a story. That, I think that's the reason why I'm connected to this book, because I feel like I'm reliving that moment. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, thank you. That's really, really flattering. You know, that's kind of what I was going for, to to relive that moment, to explore that moment and amplify that moment. Try to connect what happened with Nirvana to, you know, the culture at large in the 90s. Why did this happen? Why did they connect with so many people? And, you know, the context was you had a lot of like those hair farmer metal bands mm -hmm. and Millie Vanilli and all this pop, you know, music stuff. And it was kind of flimsy, really fun, but not much of an emotional connection. And, you know, uh, kids, you know, Gen X, they wanted something meaningful, something that hit them, you know, in the heart, you know, and the head maybe. Uh, and uh, Nirvana supplied that. They had great songs that had that kind of extra something that you can't even put your finger on yeah you can't and, and but the thing is is that it also changed the way that we wore our clothes because all of a sudden flannel became the thing yeah yeah flannel and uh, rips in your jeans but you know that <laughs> and, and you know that greasy hair you know and that was the exact like flannel is the exact opposite of spandex you know and <laughs> and that kind of greasy grungy hair is the exact opposite of the poofy hair metal hair it was just this kind of equal and opposite reaction to to all the music that had been kind of rammed down kids throats for so long they wanted something new mm -hmm. something that spoke to them well and it also yeah, spoke the, to the adults as well yeah yeah i think because yeah because people it resonated with the moment you know there, and certain artists do that you know through time um you know like bob dylan or you yeah. know the beatles what did you learn on this journey? Because, I mean, th there's so many things that we read in Rolling Stone and Cream and all of these magazines. But now that you've got all of this story in one central location, I mean, it this is life changing. Uh, yeah, it, it was yeah, uh, the experience certainly was life changing for me. And um, part of the reason I wrote the Amplified Come As You Are was to, you know, figure out what happened uh, for myself and maybe. Um, uh, you know, for other people, um, you know, a, a lot of the Nir the Nirvana audience was today was born after Kurt died. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's, uh, I think, a lot of uh, stuff that maybe they don't know about. So I write about, um, you know, what it meant for a, an indie band to sign to a major label. That was a big deal. What was selling out? Selling out was a big deal back then. Um, there was something in the 90s called heroin chic. Uh, you know, may, I think someone today might not under, even grasp what that means, but it was, you know, her, there was something called heroin chic, you know, and there was a certain, um, you know, kind of cultural and political environment going on, um, you know, with the, the first days of the Clinton presidency that, you know, the, the, the nation was changing culturally, politically. And, and I think Nirvana kind of embodied that, uh, that turbulence. And so I think it might be helpful for people to you know, help understand uh, what happened. Was it because we saw ourselves inside the videos and then when we listened to the lyrics, we were going, okay, I think this is about me. And, and if it's not, I'm going to make it about me. <laughs> I, you know, but I think it was about you. Yeah. Um, uh, when I, I first met Kurt, I uh, wrote a Rolling Stone cover story 
about Nirvana, and I was very nervous to meet him. Uh, I had never met. I, it, the rumor was that he was a heroin addict, and I'd never met a heroin addict. He was the biggest rock star in the world. He smashed guitars and screamed through his songs, and um, I was, you know, kind of intimidated. But when I met him, I walked in, you know, his room, and he was like lying in bed with his toes sticking out the bottom of the blankets. And I, I read about this in the Amplified Come As You Are. And as you know, his toenails were painted this kind of road, rosy pink. And he says, "Oh, hi." And in that moment, I realized, like, oh, I get this guy. I understand him right, right away. He was like so many other kids I grew up with, and he was sort of like me. And as we spoke, we realized that we had lots of things in common. And I don't pretend to be anything special in that regard. Tens of millions of people could relate to Kurt Cobain. He was an ordinary person who did something extraordinary. And he managed to communicate his relatability into sound, into music sound. And that was his genius. Mm -hmm. And that's why it connects, because he was speaking to you. You know, one of the things that, that it still lives inside my heart was the way that he selected Dave Grohl from Olympia, Washington, to be a part of the band. That it was not an easy journey. That these guys really had a passion for music, but it wasn't. You know, it wasn't something that we grew up doing in a garage. They had to figure out how they were going to get this band to work. Yeah, and uh, one way you get a band to work is you get a great drummer. Yeah. You know. Um, you know I think, uh, you know, uh, there's this uh, musician named Nick Lowe who's in a band called Rock Pile and produced a lot of great yeah. punk records. And he said, you know, you're only as good as your drummer. <laughs> and uh, Nirvana, you know, had a great drummer who really propelled them to to new levels of uh, greatness. And the thing is, you know, uh, you know, uh, Nirvana gets uh, lumped in, you know, with the so-called slackers. And slackers are supposed to be not hardworking, but... Kurt, Chris, and Dave were very hardworking. They were very exacting about their music, and they toured really hard and played their hearts out. So, yeah, exactly. You're right. That's the secret. You know, hard work and, um, you know, uh, a lot of talent certainly helps. You know, you, you're talking about the slackers where people could relate with that. Where where I tapped into Kurt was because he was so creative. And, and when with his drug addictions and with his challenges in life, I felt like, my God, I mean, as a creative person, you go into those places after the show and I need to get back up. I need to get back up. What am I going to do to get me back up? And I always thought that Kurt was doing that. He was trying to get back up to what he thought was an ecstasy when, in fact, being normal wasn't normal. Yes. And I think, you know, exactly. Yeah, you, you got it. Like, that's why he called it the band Nirvana. Uh, Nirvana, is, I, as I understand it, you know, means something like, you know, uh, uh, being relieved of worldly pain. Yeah. And that's what music did for him. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, you know, that's what heroin did for him, too. But music is a, a, a much better uh, and healthier way of, of dealing with with emotional and, in Kurt's case, physical pain, um, but that's that's what he that's why he played music to 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 relieve himself of pain and also I think uh, the audience sensed that too. You know, when you saw Nirvana play, it was I mean I, I don't mean to hype it too much, but I mean it was it was kind of spiritual. Mm -hmm. When they were really on, you felt like your feet were not touching the floor. Mm -hmm. They were truly they they were really really a great band. And so, yeah, that's what they were about. Yeah, they created a Beatles moment on MTV when they were unplugged. My, to, to this day, I, I can't count how many times I go to YouTube to watch those songs being played. Mm. That was a, a, a beautiful evening. Um, I was there and oh. I, I was, um, yeah, you can, you can see me sometimes in some shots. And um, uh, I know that the band was a little nervous about that because they had done an acoustic mini set uh, earlier that year at, uh, I think it was Roseland in New York City, and Kurt didn't feel it went over well. So they were a little hesitant, but um, going into it, and then, you know, they rose to the occasion because they're great musicians, um, uh, very determined, disciplined people, and, uh, of course, they were working with some great material. And they, you know, the, the the lights went on, the cameras went on, and they rose to the occasion. I think that's one of the most beautiful things about that recording, is is watching them do something that they had never really tried before and succeeding beyond anyone's wildest dreams. 
God, it, it reminded me so much of this must be what it's like to sit in your living room playing an acoustic guitar because, I mean, it was just so real. And because we've all been there before with little, you know, uh, street corner bands and things like that. Well, you know, realness, you know, that was Nirvana's stock and trade. Wow. That's what people craved after all the, the, the hair farmer bands and the yeah. pop artists and the Millie Vanillies. People wanted something real and people still want something real. And there are still lots of people out there who recognize that authenticity in Nirvana. Dude, I, I'm blessed with the opportunity to talk with a lot of these new bands that are completely unknowns. And, and they're not afraid to say, yeah, we got some grunge in this. I'm going, grunge? Whoa. Tell me about no. your roots. No. I mean, they, they, it's going to happen again. It has to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, a rock, you know, kind of moves in like uh, 20 year cycles. Um, I remember in the 80s. A lot of the coolest bands were covering bands from the 60s, like you'd see, you know, Echo and the Bunnymen, like covering the doors and stuff. And then uh, in the 90s, uh, a lot of the grunge bands were um, paying homage to bands from the 70s, like Kiss and, mm -hmm. you know, Aerosmith. And so these things, you know, come in 20 year cycles. I guess we're we're long overdue. <laughs> I mean, we're past the 20 years of uh, after uh, after grunge. But for some reason, yeah, that that kind of music resonates. And again, I think it's because of its the, the realness and the passion. And, you know, let's face it, we live in some pretty angsty times and maybe they call for some angsty music sometimes. Yeah. How come he didn't do the tight jawed approach to music like so many other grunge bands did? You know, like Pearl Jam. He didn't. He Kurt was just always I'm just Kurt. I'm just being real. Be yourself. Just be very good at it and don't fail it. I, I think Kurt was just a natural, you know, he just, uh, he couldn't help it. <laughs> and I think those are, that's, you know, those are the best artists as far as I'm concerned. People who just can't help it. They, they do something great and unique and they almost don't know that they're doing it. It just comes naturally. It sounds right to them and they do it. And that's the most, you know, unselfconscious, you know, authentic art that I think you can make. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, Michael. Back in 1992, I think the reason why I fell in love with my wife of 31 years is because she knew the words to Smells Like Teen Spirit. I mean, the way that she could belt that song out when it played on the radio, I'm going, I love this girl. This girl's got it. <laughs> yeah, you married well. <laughs> <laughs> what What was it about that song? Is it because the words or the lyrics were so mysterious that we really didn't know what he was saying? Well, I, I, I think the words uh, are mysterious in, in, on some level, but um, Kurt, uh, in, this is one of the kind of motifs that I point out in the Amplified Come As You Are. Kurt was really good at collaging things together in really evocative ways. So he, he would put things together that meant something in a way that you couldn't really put your finger on. And, you know, the word uh, is ineffable. There's an ineffable quality to his lyrics mm -hmm. uh, that that he could conjure it and that had such great impact that it was kind of magical. Um, but, you know, actually, uh, you know, but, and then of course, um, uh, uh, weird Al Yankovic, uh, made fun right. of, uh, Kurt's mumbling and his vague lyrics and stuff like that. But they, they actually meant a lot to Kurt and that's why he could sing them with such passion. There's actually in the book, I, uh, you know, that, um, uh, that famous line, uh, uh, mosquito, uh, <laughs> See, I'm not your wife. Now, now I'm blanking on the line. Um, but, but, but I, I, I actually uh, tease out actually what that particular couplet means. Um, but you know, the other thing about "Smells Like Teen Spirit," it's based on really basic rock chords. It's you know, part of it is just one, four, five, and that goes back to Louie Louie and mm -hmm. you know, more than feeling and you know, hang on, Sloopy, and a million rock songs or have that same chord progression. So it kind of it was sounded familiar and yet new and but there's also again uh, a lot of musical sophistication in there there's a a really amazing jazz group called the bad plus and they covered smells like teen spirit and they really expose like how interesting uh the, the chords of that song are and how weird that melody is it's a weird long melody in that song uh, and that, I think, is, is a particular example of Kurt's genius. It sounds great. And your people like your wife can sing along. But when you really break it down, that's a very unusual, unique melody. Mm -hmm. And 
a great testament to his songwriting genius. One of the things that touched me so well, this is how big of a fan I was of, of Kurt Cobain and still am. And, and that's when they released uh, the section of his journals where I could see his handwriting because handwriting to me is so important. And to this day, it's like I wish I could feel the depth of a page that he put his, his, mm. his palm on. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, it, it's, I, the thing about the the writing in his journals is for me is that it there's a lot of misspellings and yes. bad grammar and stuff yep. like that. Yep. And he was he Kurt was very self conscious about his his lack of you know cultural and intellectual sophistication, and he he was tr- constantly he was, but he was a very very bright man, and he was constantly thirsty for new information. And he got that first from his friend Chris Novoselic, uh, who you know was bilingual and had been to Europe and knew about lots of different kinds of music. And then he met this guy named Buzz Osborne, who founded a band called Melvins, and Buzz turned him on to punk rock and all kinds of other cool stuff. And he was constantly connecting with people who could take him up a notch and take him out of that provincial life that he had in Aberdeen and into a more sophisticated world. So he went to Olympia and he met uh, kids from the Evergreen State University, State College. Um, and then uh, he married Courtney Love, who yeah. is a very sophisticated, highly cultured person. Um, and, and he was constantly surrounding himself with people who could educate him and enlighten him and make him a more sophisticated uh, artist. Mm. You know, Don McLean has always sang about the uh, the day the music died. Well, you know what? I, I was the afternoon drive jock on 95 Double Q here in Charlotte when word came to us everything stopped on that radio station and we opened up the lines um somewhere i've got tapes of people just crying their eyes out because their their leader their creative source was gone mm-hmm. and and they they were having a tough time dealing with it yeah that was a, a terrible terrible uh day and um you know uh, you know people called him you know kurt uh a spokesman for a generation yeah. uh, you know a tag that he uh, rejected because that's quite a thing to lay on somebody. People tried to do that with Bob Dylan, and Bob Dylan really bristled about that, and eventually started writing more personal songs so he wouldn't get called a spokesman mm-hmm. for a generation. So it's a really, really heavy thing. But Kurt really did crystallize feelings that a whole generation of people and beyond felt, and he was a very sensitive person, and people. Uh, connected with him very, very deeply. And it's a great tribute to his genius that that people felt so strongly when he passed. Do you ever have personal moments where you sit back and wonder, what if Kurt were here today? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think about that often, especially, you know, as I was writing this book. Yeah, you know, there are certain artists that you look to, to who reflect like how you're feeling or maybe how you're about to feel. Um, John Lennon was one of those. Oh, yes. He was so personal and autobiographical. And the stuff he was starting to go through in middle age, just before he, he died, was really enlightening for people who were a little bit younger. Like, oh, well, here's here's what's coming around the bend for me. And he could, John Lennon could articulate that stuff. And it, it was such a terrible loss when John Lennon died because we were deprived of that. Of, of, you know, someone who was just a little bit ahead of the curve and could tell us, you know, what kind of terrain was coming up next. And the same thing with Kurt, you know, um, I, I know that he would have continued to to impart that feeling to, to people like here. Here's what I'm feeling. And you you might well be feeling it, too. And, you know, people people really relate to that. And it's it's comforting and it, it helps. Hmm. I'll tell you what, my my younger jock days are so jealous of this moment now because we didn't have this book when when Nirvana was just coming onto the music scene and we relied on the USA Today and Rolling Stone magazine to give us information to talk over the intro. I mean, we are so blessed to have this book and I can't thank you enough, Michael. Oh, thank you very much, Arrow. Uh, I'm really glad that you're you're digging the book. I am. I it, no, it, dude. It's more than digging a book. It's not going into a, onto a shelf. It's going to be put away because I want someone else in my family to have this book in the pristine shape that I have it. <laughs> thank you. That's really really touching. Uh, that's you know that's that's what I was shooting for. Thank Excellent. you. Please come back to this show anytime in the future, Michael, because I know that you love to write about rock stars, and I'm I'm looking for one for Green Day because I think Green Day was just as powerful. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Slightly younger uh, demographic, but also 
articulating uh, feelings that a whole generation felt uh, with some super catchy songs. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's uh, okay. Well, maybe you gave me an idea for my next book. <laughs> there you go. You'll be brilliant today, okay? Oh, uh, thanks. You too.